we as the church have to be able to bear fruit of the seed of the Word of God. Right. But again, it has to be the pure, unleavened bread of the Word of God, or the fruit that we bear is going to be corrupt fruit. Right? Didn't the, the men, when they made a promise to each other, too, touch the thighs? Wasn't yeah, the thighs that's what I was thinking, too. Um, that, that, you know, the, um, they swore an oath to one another? Yeah. Or yeah. one to another, they put their hand on yeah. the thigh. The head on the thigh, yeah. That, that even happened in the, in, the birth, in the blessing, didn't it? A couple times, referring. Yeah, so I guess, that, you mm-hmm. know, it, it, it's symbolic in the fact that that the, the promise has been broken, well, so that there's no place yeah. to make a promise. Uh, again, we're connecting this with the latter days. Remember Jeremiah 23? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, when was the water of bitterness going to be given? In the latter days. Right? The water of wormwood or gall would be given in the latter day or last days. David, do you think any of these things that we're studying now was something that could have been seen two mm-hmm. generations ago? Or it wasn't necessary at that Oh, time. I'm sure God has shown these things. Uh, I think the, the biggest part of these revelations are coming forth now because they're needed now. And, uh, I mean... It, it really did, wasn't helpful to understand the meaning of the last seven days in history as much as it is now. You know, well, I just mean the the similarity and the parallels of the church and, and the Old Testament that we're reading now. Yeah, concerning the law. Well, it's important to us now because these things are coming to pass now. This is really important to us now, and it wasn't important to those Jews because I'm sure that. At least 99% of them probably didn't understand what this is all about. Yeah, I guess it's a ceremony I, to them, just ceremony. I guess I was just talking about the church from 2,000 years that's been before us. Right. Well, you know, I really don't think, it, it, though we enjoy the Word of God right now, we are not seeing the unleavened bread nowhere. The unleavened bread is going to, I believe, is going to start in the last seven days. You know, the unleavened bread is not just pure doctrine. It's the anointing with the pure doctrine. You understand? It's the truth of the Word of God with nothing added, nothing taken out. It's the anointing that came upon Jesus to share that unleavened bread, which is going to happen to the man-child. You know, we may be studying some awesome truths here, but one day there's going to be a powerful anointing upon the truth of the Word of God with signs and wonders following to confirm it. And all that together is going to, be, is going to cause people to be accountable, to be held accountable by God for what they hear, what they see happening, and all those things. That's what the man-child ministry is going to be be like. It's going to be awesome truth. It's going to be the anointing. It's going to be the confirmation through the signs and wonders. And this is going to make people responsible. In other words... You're not going to be saying you were ignorant and you're not going to say... You can't say that anymore. Yes. When you've heard not, and yeah. seen, you will not be able to say that anymore. Yeah. And that's when God's going to, you know, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now God is holding these people responsible in these days, you see. I'm not saying we're not responsible when we see truth. We are. But not like people are going to be responsible in the days of head, especially when the overwhelming majority of the church hasn't heard this stuff. When Jesus came along, he shared truths, the Bible says, that were hidden from the foundation of the world. He opened his mouth and he spoke these hidden revelations that were hidden from the foundation of the world. Even though they had the law all the time, he just revealed it. He revealed it to them. He gave them understanding that they weren't getting from the Pharisees. And he confirmed it with signs and wonders. And this made them responsible. It was like this curse that we're looking at right here. Because uh, it is going to be the, the same words that are going to be a blessing to those who submit to them are going to be a curse to those who don't. Well, he had lots of followers, and not all of them wanted to hear, especially when he was talking, as they thought, like eating his flesh and, you know, drinking his blood and all the rest of it. They took it as being literal, and, and, you know, they fell away, you know, and yet they had followed him when he was saying all the the stuff that he wanted to, that they wanted to hear, but as soon as they heard stuff they didn't want to hear, you know, so there's going to be... And to the disciples... Uh, he took the disciples aside and he explained the parables mm-hmm. that he was speaking to the multitudes in. And he told them, to you it's been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. In other words, they were the elect that God was going to save out of Israel. And, you know, Israel right now is the church. But soon there's going to be an elect that God chooses out of the church to understand these things and to walk in them. The rest are going to be considered this harlot right here. And the 
children of Israel were in the desert and they came to the place where the waters were that were bitter, uh, they were poisoned and they couldn't drink them. Mara. <laughs> Mara. Mm-hmm. Does, does that have anything to do with the parallel in this? Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. I believe it's um, the waters of the curse, you know. Um, their rebellion, of course, brought them to that curse. But, but remember, <clears throat> what's, what has been a curse to us is like, remember when they went and they came to uh, a three days journey and they came to uh, the bitter waters and um, Moses cut a, a tree and threw it into the water and the waters were made sweet, right? So, you know, until the cross, that's right, until the cross, everything in this book was a curse to us. It's because of the cross that this can be made sweet to us. You know, sweet water and bitter water, James talks about coming out of the same fountain, you know. Well, in a way that happens because, and it shouldn't be, we should only have the sweet waters coming out of us and not the bitter waters, but in a way that happens even from the Word of God because the part of it that we're not submitted to, to God in becomes a curse to us, and the part that we don't walk under the blood in becomes a curse to us. And when we walk under the blood, because of the, the cross, the bitter waters are made sweet. And uh, this, these waters are going to be bitter for the woman who is guilty of receiving the seed that is not her husband's. Okay, And they're going to bring a curse upon her at that time to defile her and to cause her to never bear fruit again. Verse 28. Verse 29. This is the law of jealousy. When a wife, being under her husband, goeth aside and is defiled, or when the spirit of jealousy cometh upon a man, and he is jealous of his wife, then shall he set the woman before the Lord, and the priest shall execute upon her all this law. And the man shall be free from iniquity, and that woman shall bear her iniquity. So when this, when they were under this, I mean, this is reality that they really did this with the priest and everything. You know, right now, think about it. You know, we, we've seen some things in the Word that we... We might obey, but most of the church disagrees with or doesn't obey or don't see the need in obeying it. Well, right now, seemingly the church is getting away with disobeying some of these principles in the Word of God, in the New Testament. But there's going to come a time during the last days that the water is going to become a curse to these people. In other words, we're looking out there now. The church ignores it because they've never been judged for it before. But all of a sudden, the water that comes out of the earthen vessel, the pure water that comes out of the earthen vessel is going to make them responsible and is going to prove them whether they've been receiving the Word of God or whether they've been receiving another seed. You see, and it's going to bring judgment. We're coming to the last, the last seven days when the Word of God is going to be powerful to bear fruit and also to bring judgment. I mean, people that have not obeyed the Word of God today are either going to obey it quickly during those seven days or they're going to quickly fall away and never bear fruit again. You know, Israel, Israel went on for uh, 4,000 years until the man-child came and shared the unleavened bread. All of a sudden, they either came into the kingdom as the disciples did or they were destroyed. You understand? The sudden judgment is coming to the church who is a member of the harlot in the last seven days. And at the same time, those who are given understanding and grace who are in there, who desire the truth and are looking for the coming of the Lord, these people are going to bear fruit unbelievable. You know? I was just thinking about something in the Bible that talks about how Jesus grew in stature with the Father and with man through his obedience and his, his troubles or his trials. Right, and and in, in understanding this, uh, this word brings obedience, and God says it's better for obedience than it is for offerings or sacrifice. Yes. So the fruit, maybe too, that it brings forth is, is obedience. You know, you know, there's something. There are some literal things in here too. Some, you know, one thing it talks about the woman being submitted to her husband. Well, I mean, a lot of people don't like to hear that nowadays either. And the church doesn't agree with it much. And the women have become heads of the church. And, of course, that's unbiblical. The head covering is mentioned here, too. 
Guess what? There's going to come a time when these things that we think are not important are going to be important because they're written in the Word of God. Uh, the church has been getting away with doing things because they want to do it. But for the people who love God and are drawn of the Lord and are following the Lord in the days to come, I think they're going to receive the anointing, the power of the Holy Spirit, these things that are necessary to make them desire to do what's right, enjoy doing what's right, enjoy being a, uh, pleasing unto the Lord, and the rest that keep on going the same way they've been going. They're, they haven't changed a thing. They're just doing what they used to do, and they're still doing it in the face of what they're seeing and hearing. These people are going to fall away. We can't afford in the days when the power of God and the true Word of God is being shared to keep on going the way we've been going in the past. I mean, the Jews did that. They kept the same doctrine when they listened to Jesus. They didn't change their doctrine. They didn't repent and change their mind. They didn't receive the Holy Spirit when it was offered. They kept on doing things the way they'd always done things. And it became a reprobation to them. So we're coming to a change one way or the other. Everybody that's in the church is coming to a change one way or the other. Either it's going to be a blessing or it's going to be a curse, but they're going to be in the last days. And now for the people in the last days, according to Jeremiah 23, now for the people in the last days who don't do something with the Word of God, it's going to become a curse to them. And the curse is going to be evident. The, cur- the Bible talks about, I mean, what do you think the book of uh, Revelation is all about? It's the curse being loosed on the earth, isn't it? It's the curse. And, and even greater than that, in the great terrible day of the Lord after that, is the curse being loosed on the earth. Why? What do you think causes the great curse that's going to come upon the earth in those seven years in the book of Revelation? I'll tell you what I think causes it. I think it's the man child ministry and the two witnesses ministry. That's what causes it. Because here they are sharing the unleavened bread. They're making people responsible. They're signs and wonders. And people aren't doing anything with it. And these curses are just being poured out on the earth. And the first judgment over there, by the way, did you notice the first judgment is uh, this white horse? And uh, the one riding on top of that white horse. I'll tell you who I think that one is. You know, uh, Everybody said it's either Jesus or or the devil, or the Antichrist, you know, my opinion is, the one on the white horse is the man-child, which is Jesus, in a body. Right? Revelation chapter 6, the very first judgment, Revelation 6 and verse 1, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say, with the voice of thunder, come, and I saw and behold a white horse, And he that sat thereon had a bow, and there was given unto him a crown, and he came forth conquering and to conquer. A crown is a a symbol of uh, the throne. You know, I mean, uh, Jesus said he overcame and he sat down with his father in his throne. He had dominion, in other words. In those three and a half years of Jesus' ministry, he was. He was conquering the devil, conquering his works, conquering the wicked. Conquering the flesh of his disciples. He was conquering. Everything he did was to conquer, you know. Conquered his own flesh, you know. The man-child is the fulfillment of the first three and a half years of Jesus' ministry in these coming days. And he's going to be conquering. And the truth that comes out of his mouth is going to do one of two things. It's either going to bless you or it's going to curse you, right? The more thing for us right now is to submit to what we see and read in this word. Because it's coming with anointing. What would the bow signify? Look, look at uh, Zechariah. If this will help us. Zechariah 9 and verse 13. These verses in here are totally, they're totally hiding the point unless, you, wow. unless you're seeing something here. You know, unless you're seeing the revelation here. 9 13. For I have bent Judah for me. I have filled the bow with Ephraim. <laughs> Sounds crazy, doesn't it? <laughs> and I will stir up my thy sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece. Greece was the beast here, right? Okay. Against thy sons, O Greece, and I will make thee as a sword of a mighty man. And the Lord shall be seen over them, and his arrow shall go forth as the lightning, and the Lord will blow the trumpet 
and will go with whirlwinds of the south. In other words, God is going to judge the sons of Greece, which is the beast. In, Jesus, in, in this day, Greece had conquered the people of God. It was the beast in this day. You see. In our day, Greece would be the beast around us, the wicked around us, the, the conquering kingdom around us. Okay. Well, Judah was, um, was of course, the tribe that, that um, were the overcomers. They were the ones that uh, had the temple. They were the ones that had the real temple. They were the ones that worshipped the true Lord. They didn't have the, the golden calf in, in their jurisdiction, right? They didn't have the false priests, all right? For I have bent Judah. Judah is the bow. And I have filled the bow with Ephraim. Mm-hmm. Ephraim is what? Multitude of nations. Right. That's the multitude, the great multitude of God's people in the latter days. Ephraim represents that. Jesus bent the bow, but he filled it with the disciples. And he sent them out to conquer. You see, And they did. I mean, uh, uh, Jesus sent out the, t- the man-child sent out the two witnesses to conquer. They were like a, like you said here, a mighty sword. They were his arrows. You know, it was the man in Proverbs who had his quiver full? You know, it's, it's, but it was talking about his children, right? Yeah. He had his quiver full of arrows. He was talking about his children. Well, the disciples were Jesus' children. Mm-hmm. They were his spiritual children, right? And the man child has uh, some spiritual children. You know, our forefathers should be. The people who wrote this book, right? The Apostle Paul said he was a father, you know. That he begat the Corinthians through the gospel. He was their father, their spiritual father, right? Well, it would be like the Lord through the man-child in these days raising up disciples and sending them forth two by two to do the work that he had done, right? That's what I think this is talking about. The man-child raising up the two witnesses to conquer. That's what I think Revelation chapter 6 one and two is talking about. I don't think it's not talking about Jesus literally, but Jesus spiritually in a body, and and the disciples that go forth are the uh, the arrows. That's what I think. So I think that's one reason what we're looking at here. First of all, if you remember Jeremiah 23, the last days was when he was going to give them the bitter water. The last days, and I think the last days are the last seven days when the bitter waters are going to come forth. They ate the lamb, but they also ate bitter herbs. Right? In the seven days. Bitter herbs, right? Well, because because when you eat the Word of God, it's sweet in your mouth, but it's bitter to your belly. Remember how he told Ezekiel that and John that? The Word of God is... is he told him to eat the roll. The roll was the Word of God. He said it was sweet in his mouth, but it was bitter in his belly. The Bible says their God is their belly. Your belly represents you know, false God to you. It's what your flesh desires. It's what it lusts after. You know, it represents that. You know. Excuse me. What was your question again? The Why did they herbs? have to eat the bitter herbs? Okay. The bitter herbs. The bitter herbs. Why did they eat the, the lamb with bitter herbs? Because what was bitter to the flesh was what the lamb is. The lamb that we eat and we partake of is bitter to the flesh. We like the Word of God, we want to serve God, and it's nice, but when your flesh obeys it, it's death to the flesh, right? Well, symbolically, then, our belly is our flesh. Yes, symbolically, right. Our belly is our flesh. The Bible says their God is their belly. So, yeah, we partake of the Word of God, but it is bitter to your flesh because your flesh don't want to obey it. It's, It's life to your spirit man, but it's death to your carnal man, right? The Word of God is. It's a blessing to you, but it's a curse to your flesh because it's going to put him to death, right? Of course, if a person walks after the flesh, they're going to die. And um, if a person walks after the Spirit, they're going to live. Well, the death angel passed over and then they finished eating the lamb. Mm-hmm. And they had to eat all of the lamb or they didn't, they didn't escape the death angel. They didn't leave anything for the next day. And the, all of the lamb is the unleavened bread, right? They had couldn't they eat it or burn it if there was any that remained. Yeah, any that would remain, they had to burn it before morning. In other words, it had to all be used up before morning. Mm-hmm. Right. Truly, you know, what we don't what we don't eat is going to be lost. 
like the manna in the wilderness. The manna in the wilderness, if they tried to save it up just one day, well, it, it bred worms. It was lost. Yeah, that was the next question is why did the, what they gathered more than they needed gather worms just by the next day? Well, we're not supposed to save any manna until the next day. We're supposed to eat it all today. We're supposed to eat our, our day's portion. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this for you to prove you to see whether you'll keep my word or not. See, we're supposed to be partaking of a day's manna every day. And um, if we're not, it's we're losing it. It's not going to uh, it's not going to manifest Christ in us, it's not going to bear fruit in us, and it's going to be lost. Well the manna is going to be the only thing that's nourishing anyway. I, I guess that was the question I'd ask when you guys were discussing. The man is the seed of the Word of God, right? It's not the false seed that the harlots were taken of, the false lies and doctrines that the harlots were taken of. It's the pure seed of the Word of God. That's the only thing that can give life and, the others can And Jesus was sharing the manna. He was the manna to these people. He was uh, the bread that came down out of heaven that gives life to the world. He told them if you didn't, if you didn't eat, if you didn't eat that manna, you didn't have any life. You were lost. And uh, I suspect... Kurt, the man child is going to be able to say the same thing. The same thing. Because uh, the anointing is going to come upon this first fruits people to share the pure word of God. The anointing to confirm it with signs and wonders. And uh, he's going to be able to say the same thing. If you don't, you know, Moses, who was a, a type of Jesus in the Old Testament, he said, A prophet shall the Lord thy God raise up unto you like unto me. And everybody that doesn't hearken unto the words of that prophet shall be cut off from among the people. In other words, those that didn't listen to Jesus were cut off. I mean, it's just like what we just read here in this parable about the woman uh, that was defiled who didn't receive the seed of her husband. She was cut off. Oh, we've got an awesome thing coming. I mean, God's going to provide for His people through this ministry that, that God is about to raise up. And He's going to send His people out to do the exact same thing. God, through the man-child, is going to raise up the rest of the church to do the same ministry. Can I... There's something that's sort of been on my mind about my meeting with Benjamin yesterday. There was a period of time when I was just so... I just felt like I needed to get away from him. And after... after, There came a time when he asked me did I want him to leave, and I said yes. And after he left, I felt guilty, and I felt relieved. I mean... And I prayed about it last night. I remember two incidences in my life in the, in the period of years I've been a Christian when, when I know God spoke in my heart or my spirit to not keep chasing after this person to share and beg and plead with them about God. And last night I felt that same relief in, in this circumstance. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I mean, I prayed about it last night, and I asked God to forgive me if there was anything fleshly in this situation at all. But in a way, isn't this what we're studying tonight, too? I I know I remembered uh, something that was spoken in the church before that I was going to that said that there's, there's a time coming when you have to... something about if you can't... you know, that the... Christians that are walking are not going to be able to stop and pick up those that are have fallen or that are weak or something like that. You know, you and Mary both have talked about a race that we're running, you know, mm-hmm. and that um, Mary, when one of Mary's dreams, they were on a racetrack. No, this was oh. the racetrack. Oh, that's right. Yeah. And she was with a couple of other people or more or whatever. But anyway, one of them wanted to stop under a shade tree and rest. And, and um, yeah, she felt like she needed to say, no, we can't rest. You know, we've got to keep on running. Keep on running, yeah. But anyway, I, I just, there was a guilty feeling of thinking, you know, uh, you know, I'm, I'm supposed to give help, which which I knew I was supposed to get give, but I knew at the same time it was just a usury. I, I searched our, our situation and I didn't find anything where you know, he was receiving anything that we talked about or that I shared with him. In mm-hmm. fact, he would go back to this other personality type thing. And 
And there was just a period of time when it was like I felt like I was trapped and I had to get away. And once he left, I felt total peace. And at the same time, I felt sort of guilty. And so I, that's why I was praying last night for God to give me confirmation that, you know, I wasn't, you know, that, that I shouldn't feel guilty or whatever the situation was. Yeah. But tonight during the study, I, I believe that, you know, I, that I've been released. I mean, I just feel peace about it now. Yeah. Only the of God will hear the words of God. That's, you know, Jesus, um, Jesus lost a lot of disciples, you know, over that very thing about receiving the uh, manna, basically my body and my blood, he said, you know. He lost a lot of disciples over that one thing, and no doubt that's going to lose a lot of people in the coming days, you know. People that don't understand, you can't receive anything but the Word of God. Now, it's unleavened, the unleavened bread. Anything else will bring forth another fruit, you know. Look at this verse, Deuteronomy 31 and 29. This is Moses speaking, but I believe you can see Jesus in this. Since the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3 that Moses was to his house what Christ was to his house. You see, God is paralleling, very clearly paralleling Moses and Jesus. Moses was the first fruits in his day. And um, when he put to death the Egyptian, which was his old man, he left Egypt, which is the world, and he married a Gentile bride. Moses very clearly was a type of Christ in everything that he did. Well, here he says, For I know that after my death, again, I think you can see Jesus here too, I know that after my death you will utterly corrupt yourselves and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you. Literally, the church fell into the dark ages. Great falling away, you know. And we haven't seen the end of that falling away yet. You know, we're, we're going to see a great revival for those who love God and, and have the gift to um, hear and understand. But to the rest, there's going to be a, a continued great falling away. And evil will befall you in the last days, or latter days. Same word. Because you will do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger through the works of your hands. So, I mean, you can see Jesus in that, can't you? He said, uh, A prophet shall the Lord thy God raise up unto you like unto me. And everyone who doesn't hearken unto the words of that prophet shall be cut off from among the people. Go, go to Deuteronomy chapter 4. After Moses talks about his, his death in verse 22, look in verse 23. Take heed to yourself, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make you a graven image in the form of anything which the Lord thy God hath forbidden thee. A graven image is like the golden calf, right? The false Jesus, right? For the Lord thy God is a devouring fire, a jealous God. When thou shalt beget children and children's children, and you shall have been long in the land, and shall corrupt yourselves. Well, that's true of Christianity too, isn't it? Long in the land, but corrupted themselves. And make a graven image in the form of anything, and shall do that which is evil in the sight of the Lord thy God, to provoke him to anger. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day, that you shall soon utterly perish from off the land, whereunto you go over the Jordan to possess. You soon, suddenly perish from off the land. You shall not prolong your days upon it, but shall utterly be destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you shall be left few in number among the nations, whither the Lord shall lead you away. So the, Lord, the Lord's people are going into bondage among the nations because of corruption, because of uh, not paying attention to the words of the Lord, right? Verse 28. And there you shall serve God's, the work of men's hands, isn't it true? Isn't it true that the church has done just exactly that? They're, they're serving a God that's not the God, a Jesus that's not the Jesus. It's the work of man's hands. It's man's ingenuity. Wood and stone. Remember, remember 
that our what we're building on the foundation of Christ is not wood, hay, and stubble, but um, gold and silver and precious stones, right? Which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from thence you shall seek the Lord thy God, and thou shalt find him when thou searchest after him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. When thou art in tribulation, and all these things have come upon thee, in the last days thou shalt return to the Lord thy God. It's like God saying, hey, look, all this is going to happen to you, but in the last days you're going to return to the Lord thy God. And hearken unto his voice. For the Lord thy God is a merciful God. He will not fail thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swear unto you. So God is saying, pretty much, what happened to Israel has already happened to the church. We're com- now we're coming to the last days when God is going to restore, or else reprobate. He's going to do one or the other, depending upon whether you're Israel who will come out from among them like the disciples were, or Israel that would stay in the same old state as the majority of the body did. Okay, But for those who will come out from among them like the disciples did, and follow the Lord in the wilderness, in the tribulation, verse 30, right? He's going to restore everything. Same thing he said in Joel. He's going to the latter days, the latter rain is going to restore everything that the palmer worm and the canker worm and the, his army of worms that has come against his crop. Everything that's been taken from his crop for 2,000 years, God's going to restore in the latter days or last days. That's going to be neat. But obviously, what he restored to Israel, he restored to those disciples who followed him and the rest. They weren't going to enter into it. They weren't receiving it. And he reprobated them. Didn't we study something that was before about wormwood, about what it represented or what it was? Well, in the book of Revelation, the word is used, but it uh, could be some connection there. I don't know. I never really tried to connect it, but it could be some kind of connection there. Wormwood. They say that that Chernobyl nuclear reactor, well, that Chernobyl means wormwood. I don't know if that's true. You hear a lot of things, but it was sure being passed around a while back when Chernobyl did its thing, you know. So I don't know if um, they could have something to do with the, the nuclear catastrophe that's coming. I heard there was a, a meteor or an asteroid named Wormwood yeah. that comes close to Book the of Revelation, yeah. That's where I read Star named Wormwood. That's what you're referring to right now, then. So yeah, that's what Kirk's Kurt, talking about, yeah. Oh, okay. What we talked about. So, but, you know... That wormwood there could be a nuclear catastrophe rather than... You know, the Bible talks about Babylon, how it was going to be a, like a burning mountain thrown into the sea. Well, that's described in the book of Revelation too. A burning mountain is thrown into the sea. I, I thought about, you know, when you have a nuclear war, it, it just vaporizes things that go up in, a, in an atomic cloud that goes up in the atmosphere and maybe drifts out over the ocean and falls into the sea. Yeah. I don't know, that just was a thought I had about a wormwood cloud, you know. A, a mountain. A mountain is a kingdom. A mountain in the Bible is a kingdom. Well, you know, what happened to Chernobyl? Remember what happened to Chernobyl? When it went up, it uh, drifted out over parts of England and um, uh, Western Europe. And uh, they, they, a lot of people in England still don't eat there's a lot of vegetarians. Yeah, a lot of vegetarians there. All, all my family, yeah. Yeah. Why? Because of the, the um, acid rain and stuff from the, the Chernobyl thing causing the... And uh, the mad cow. Well, they well, I don't think England caught the worst of it, did they? There's a lot of no, people it, it, a lot uh, of Finland and those type of places, uh-huh. like too, some the, up there. Yeah. Uh, Sweden and um, Greenland and those type of places. And Scotland, you know. Scotland, it affected the fishing industry. Yeah, the fish are all yeah, there, but good over there. Yeah. Really? You can't, can't fish. You can get fish, but yeah, I don't know where they're bringing it in from anymore. Yeah, they, 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 I mean, the, fish, the fishing industry went down because yeah, the, the, the waters was, even though it was salt water fishing, right. it still was it contaminated. Still contaminated. Yeah. And shellfish the, the, down in the mm-hmm. south um, used to get a lot of shellfish, you know, crabs and. Um, um, those type of things. 
they um, so it's sort of like nuclear fallout or yeah, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And well, they import their meat in and everywhere they would get snails. Yeah. <coughs> but they, they grew a lot of um, soya under um, the made like greenhouse greenhouses greenhouse. out of you know plastic, the plastic, plastic. Yeah. and then uh, used um, you know soil that had been cleansed and whatever wow. to grow stuff because um, you know they couldn't let it grow onto the ground. Good because of the stuff coming out there. Yeah. You know, in Revelation 18, in verse 21, he talked about Babylon. He said, A strong angel took up a stone, as it were a great millstone, and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus, with a mighty fall, shall Babylon, the great city, be cast down, and shall be found no more at all. But the thing is, if you look at the same Babylon over in in Jeremiah chapter 51, he calls it a mountain. What does the great millstone remind you of? Remember Jesus' teaching about the millstone? Something would be better if a millstone was tied around your neck and going to the sea. Right. He's talking about if you cause these little ones to stumble. Mm -hmm. He's talking about Babylon who caused his little ones to stumble. Mm -hmm. Now he's saying it would be better for them to be thrown in the sea. Well, Jesus said, well, that's what's going to happen in Revelation 18. But Jeremiah 51 in verse 25 he talks about Babylon over there as a burning mountain, cast down as a burning mountain. Verse 25. Behold, I'm against the old destroying mountain. In other words, a mountain is a kingdom in the Bible. The kingdom of Babylon represents a mountain. The kingdom of God is Mount Zion, right? But this mountain is, is a mountain, the mountain of uh, Babylon. It says the Lord which destroyest all the earth. And I will stretch out my hand upon thee and roll thee down from the rocks and make thee a burnt mountain. And they shall not take of thee a stone for a corner nor a stone for foundations. But thou shalt be desolate forever, says the Lord. Kind of makes you think of a nuclear situation when nobody wants to touch anything that's left. Well, a burning mountain, mm-hmm. if you look at it, it, it looks like a circle with a hole in the middle, like a, like a volcano. Uh, that could look like a millstone, because the millstone was a, a circle with a hole cut out mm-hmm. in the middle of it. The, the mountain could look like something thrown into the... You know, if you're looking down on it, like... Verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 46, At the noise of the taking of Babylon, the earth trembleth, and the cry is heard among the nations. You know, how can how can Babylon fall in an hour? Unless we're talking about a nuclear war, right? And this burning mountain is going to be thrown into the sea. So what we got to do is come out of that kingdom, right? That that mountain, and go to Zion where there's safety. God said He's going to He's going to uh, redeem us from Babylon. He's going to save us out of Babylon. Well, we were told that that as soon as we come into the kingdom, we fall captive to Babylon. Right? Mm-hmm. We go into captivity to Babylon. Well, isn't that really what happened to all of us? We got saved, but we were so ignorant of God and His ways that we got trapped in some religion. You know, instead of reala- realizing that the Lord didn't start any of these things, it was the wolves that started them. See, God's people are going to, God's true people are going to discover that those disciples who followed Jesus came out of the, the sects and the denominations of Judaism, and they followed Him, and they were one flock. And that's what's going to happen again. The man-child is going to bring together people out of apostate Christianity into one flock. Jesus said there's going to be one flock and one shepherd. And the one shepherd he's talking about, of course, is the Lord. He's the real shepherd, right? And you're going to know his voice. Not They're going to know his voice. Right. They're not going to know anybody else's voice. They're just going to know his. So. That's right. What did Jesus come to do? In, in John chapter 10... He came to open the sheepfold and to call his sheep out. 